Hi, I'm, uh, welcome to another session of the Potter's Roundtable from Washington Street Studios. I'm Phil Bernberg. Um, I wanted to bring up something about our presentations. We've decided since we have a lot of topics that cover the whole really spectrum of pottery activities, that we're gonna break them down into four sections. Um, pottery making sequence, which is what we've been doing so far. Use of raw materials, which will be glazed chemistry and that sort of thing. Kilns and firings, we'll be talking about different kinds of kilns and the results. And then some additional pottery skills, such as how does physics, for example, enter into pottery? Or how do you, what are some simple math calculations you can use? So, so far we've been working on section one. We, last time we talked about tips for successful glazing. And so today we're gonna to talk about, before we get into actual firings, we're gonna talk about pyrometric cones and the use of pyrometric cones. What are they and how are they used? Welcome to the Potter's Roundtable, a monthly podcast where we share our passion for the ceramic arts and a collection of topics specific to potters. Remember to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. Enjoy the show. Okay, so pyrometric cones, what are they? Well, first of all, just in terms of the definition, pyrometric, if you just translate that, means measuring heat. And that's basically what they do. So, and basically, pyrometric cones are mo little molded spikes, such as this, little molded spikes of clay. And they're actually, important thing to keep in mind is, they're actually made out of clay bodies. So they're, they, they, can, they, they typically come in two sizes, what, one about an inch long and the other roughly two inches long. And they're each, each cone is made up of a slightly different composition. And they're also, they're, they're, rough, they're triangular in cross section. So they're little triangular spikes made out of different kinds of clay or clay bodies. And the idea is that when they're heated, the different compositions soften or melt at different temperatures so that we can use them as indications of heat or temperature. Um, and the cone, so the cones are really ideal for measuring the, the progress of a firing. You can watch if you put in different cones of different, different numbers or different compositions, you can watch the cones fall successively or bend or soften successively as the temperature increases. Typically, they're supported in a standing position, leaning at eight degrees. That's the standard because when these were manufactured, they had to standardize the position, standardize the sizes and the compositions. So the standard position is leaning from the vertical at eight degrees, and they're typically supported at the base. And they can either be supported in a, in, a, in a commercial ceramic base, these can be purchased that, and the, the cones fit into them. And one of the, the, one of the things that these, these bases do is they help support the cone at the proper angle. But frankly, you don't need these. You can just, most people just, you end up, you can just put the cones in a small base of clay. You can make a little strip of clay and put the cones into it. Um, so during the firing, the, the, the cones are, will, since they start off leaning, as they get soft, they bend and they, and they bend over. And the point is you can see this, you can watch them do this through the peephole or the, the, the viewport of the kiln. So you can, you can follow the progress of the firing by watching what the cones were doing. Um, and here's an example, for example, of a, of a firing. These were three cones set up, and we'll talk more about this later, but this is a cone pack. This was three, a group of three cones of increasing temperature number so this is an example of a perfect cone 10 firing. This, is the, this was a seven, nine, and a 10 cone going to higher temperatures. So this is where the cone is just bent down. So when the cone reached that position, we knew that it was time to end the firing. Cones were actually invented in the late 1800s by a German chemist called Hermann Seeger. He was also the one that developed some of the early ideas about the chemistry of glazes. He worked in a porcelain factory, and he was basically, he was the guy that was in charge of preparing the glazes, preparing the, gla the clay bodies, and also solving all the problems for the porcelain factory. This, these were the days when they did a lot of these sort of very complicated porcelain sculptures and figurines and that sort of thing. So this was, this was sophisticated work. The first cone that was actually developed was, was what was called a cone number five, because based on the chemistry situation that the, the the scheme that he had worked out for, for, for glazes, which we now know, we call it the unity molecular formula, a way of, of expressing the formula for a glaze. The particular formula that he had for a certain porcelain body had a certain amount of silica in it. It had, in, in the, according to the formula, had five molecules of silica. So he called the cone for that firing a cone five. And then his, the cones that he developed 
with the, with the appropriate compositions and temperatures came to be known as Seeger cones. And they're still manufactured. They're still used in Europe and in other countries. We, however, use cones that are called Orton cones, O-R-T-O-N, and they're produced by the Orton Ceramic Foundation in Ohio. And one thing to keep in mind is that the temperature designations of the cones, each cone is assigned an approximate temperature designation for when it melts. We're gonna talk more about this, but to identify them, we still, we talk about them in terms of temperature. So each cone has, a, has an approximate temperature equivalent. Well, the, the different brands of the different systems of cones have slightly different temperatures for the same number. So for example, a cone, an Orton cone number six is not representative of exactly the same temperature as a Seeger cone six. So this is something to keep in mind if you ever get to use some of these other cones. But in the United States, at least, we, tend to, we, we use primarily Orton cones. Orton actually makes three, three types of cones. They make the, what's called the large cone, which is this one right here. This is the original type of cone that was made. And this is also the standard, so that when we talk about a cone being a cone six or a cone 10 or whatever the designation is, we're referring to how a large cone behaves. They also produced small cones, and these were developed for use in electric kilns. They were smaller so that you could see them through the peephole, and they were also, they could be used in the kiln sitter. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, then finally, what they developed was a self-supporting cone so that it didn't have to be placed into a, into a base, a clay base or a ceramic base, it, it, it came with its own base. And the, the last thing that they developed was what are called pyrometric bars. And these were small, very similar in size to the, to the cone, but instead of being tapered, they were just small uniform bars. And they were made strictly for use in the, in the electric kiln, kiln sitter. The cones, the cones are numbered from, o, we'll talk a little bit about this numbering system, but they're numbered from O22 to O1, with the numbers decreasing from O22 to O1, and then from one to 45. And this is in, in order of increasing temperature. So the cones go O22 to O1, there is no cone zero, and then they go from cone one to cone 45. Cone 45, by the way, represents the melting point of aluminum oxide, which is way above what most ceramics would be processed at. The numbering system, this, this rather strange numbering system came about because the first cones that, that Seeger developed were all in the low single digit numbers, like one, two, three, four, five. So he numbered them that way. Well, as time went by, they realized that the, the cones were very useful However, and when they wanted to add more cones to extend the range to lower temperatures, the only way they could, they could create numbers was to number them going to lower temperature from zero, even though there is no zero. So you start, when you go from one to 45, the temperature is increasing, and then they numbered them the other way with decreasing temperature going 01 down to 022. So you ended up with a strange numbering system, but that's because it happened, it, it wasn't all organized at once, it happened over a long period of time. Um, the cones, just for a little extra information, the cones when they were originally produced were originally slip cast in molds, and for quite a while now they've been cold pressed. The, the, the ceramic powders are mixed with a binder, a little organic, sort of organic glue, and they're pressed in a die. And originally they were pressed as individual cones, and now they've gone over to pressing them in these twins. And these, these when you, when, this is two cones together, and you, can, you snap them apart when you're ready to use them. And this actually is, this is actually a, a, a nice advantage. For one thing, it makes it, it's, it's easier for them to produce them, but it also, it protects the points. So at least I found that I, there's less breakage as long as you snap them, and they, they snap apart pretty easily, but there's less breakage because these, these rather fragile points aren't bumping around in the packaging. And just as, speaking of the packaging, originally the cones were shipped in a box, like these, this would be for the large cones or the small cones, and they were packed in loose vermiculite, and now they're packed in foam. They're just, they're wrapped, they're just wrapped in a foam packaging like this. And the cones, frankly, I think they survive better the fact that now they are, they are pressed into this twin form. Okay, um, so let's, let's look a little bit. The cones, the cones are actually, in terms of the information that you need to, to work with cones, are, are published in what is called a cone chart. 
And the different manufacturers of cones publish these charts. This is a, this is a sample taken from an Orton cone chart. So this is, what, this, what this shows is that the typical cone chart has, has several bits of information. It has the, the different types of the sizes of cones. So in this case, this would be large cones and small cones. And then it also shows different heating rates. We'll talk about this in a minute, but different cones respond slightly differently depending on how quickly they're heated. So I, I'm, not, I'm not sure exactly why they chose these particular heating rates, but um, these, this is the standard that they've worked out. So this means basically 108 degrees per hour for the last one, for the last 100 degrees of the firing. This is 270 degrees Fahrenheit per hour for the last 100 degrees of the firing, and this is 540. And again, I don't know why they, they chose those particular temperatures. So what the chart is basically showing is that if you take a particular cone and heat it at a particular rate, when that cone bends, it represents roughly, and I say roughly, a certain temperature. So that's what this is showing. So this is so this is a small now this is I've just shown this part this is the lowest end of the cone chart and in fact I, from what I understand they don't make O22 O20 and and, o, and O21 for the large cones there were also if if you had a, a chart here for the bars there'd be a, there'd be a heading here for the pyrometric bars there'd also be a heading here for the large self-supporting cones because the self-supporting cones the large ones again are not exactly have, have don't exactly have the same temperature equivalents as the as the plain large cones so one of the things that, that, uh, that what you can see if you look at some of the details from this is that the, the large cones bend of the same number bend at a lower temperature than the small cones. So if we look at, at the large cones, for example, for, for car large carbon number 018, regardless of how fast we're heating it up, whether it's 108 or, 100 or 270, they both bend at a lower temperature than the equivalent small cones. So the, the, even though the compositions are the same, as far as I understand it, for the same number, they don't respond to heat exactly the same. So in other words, a large cone six does not bend at the same temperature as a small cone six. And what I use sort of as a rule of thumb is I assume that a small cone is going to bend at, one, at, at approximately one cone number higher. So a small, I, this is the way, and it, it works out pretty well, this approximation. So a small cone six is roughly equivalent to a large cone seven. And the large cones, that's the standard. So when we say a cone six firing or a cone six glaze or a cone six clay body, we're talking about compared to a large cone. The heating rate, the reason, and the heating, the, the, also now with the different heating rates, one of the, one of the we'll talk, again, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute. But when you, when you go to a faster heating rate to the same cone, in other words, if I'm heating up and I want to make the cone 019 bend, if I heat it faster, when the cone 019 bends, I will actually be at a higher temperature, a slightly higher temperature. And in general, that effect is not going to really have much of an, of an impact on the clay body, but it can have a significant effect on the glazes because glazes 10 or 20 degrees can mean a lot in terms of whether they melt or whether they run. So we'll, again, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but this, can, this effect can have an effect on glazes, the fact that the heating rate has an effect. And so that's, what, that's, why they, that's one of the reasons why they show the different heating rates, because the actual final temperature is slightly different. Okay, how are cones used? Well, I mentioned that they're set into a base of soft clay or they can be used in a ceramic plaque. And one of the, the nice features about the cones is that the bottom of the cone is already set up so that if you press the cone flat, it automatically is leaning at an eight degree angle. So if you roll, if you wanna make your own cone packs, as they're called, a group of cones, you can roll out a small log of clay and then just push the cones into the clay and if you push them down so that the bottom, and you, as you push them in, wiggle them a little bit, so the bottom is sitting flat, then the cone will end up leaning at the correct angle of eight degrees. Another, one thing that's important, though, to keep in mind is when you set the cones into the cone pack, you want to set them so that they fall sideways, not in a row. So that if, I, if I'm looking down on my lump of clay or my cone pack, I want to set them in 
so that when I, when I set these, these, I'm drawing the bases now of the cones. I set them in so that the bases line up like that so that they will fall in that direction. That way, one cone doesn't land on top of another. I don't want to set them up. Like that, so that one cone falls on top of another. And this is an example of what happens when you do that. Because one, then if one cone doesn't go all, in this case, this cone actually hit a pot next to it, and then it kept this, this next cone from completely falling. So I couldn't tell exactly when this cone was down. Um, the other thing that, that I found, especially in studio situations, like community studios or in schools, is that we have a, a range of people maybe making up, or preparing these cone packs. If you accidentally put in the wrong cone in the position, for instance, in this case, this was a number seven, and then a nine, and then a 10. Well, if you, if you happen to put the wrong cone in here so that the cone, let's say this was a 10 also, it, and it wouldn't bend, then the next cone can't get out, it can't move around it. So you'll have a cone sticking up, blocking the way for the cones to fall. They sh you want them to fall freely and fall sideways so that nothing, if, if, anything get, if this cone happens to be the wrong cone, it won't prevent this one from bending. And you'll see it right away. If you see this cone bending before this one does, you'll know that somebody put in the wrong cone. There's only been one situation in my 30 years of working with pottery where I found that the box of cones was mislabeled. So that's a really rare occurrence. So that if there, I've never really had to consider that to be a problem. So the other thing is what I, in, and when you're making up these cone packs, sort of standard practice for making them up is to put three cones together, at least three. You don't have to, you could put in five or 10, but standard practice is to put in three. So you might set them up like this. And this, the way they're leaning, this would be the first cone that's, that's going to fall. And then after that one falls, this one would fall, and then this one would fall. And so these cones are actually given a name. This is called the guide cone. The guide cone. This is called the witness cone. And this is called the guard. G-U-A-R-D. And the point is, you put in one cone. The witness cone is, the co is your target. That's the temperature that you're, you're trying to achieve. You put in a guide cone, which is one cone lower, so that while you're watching the firing, if you see this guide cone starting to bend, you know that it's not a good time to go out and get a beer, because pretty soon, the cone that you need to watch is going to be falling. And the guard cone tells you that you've overfired. So basically, if you miss it and you see the witness cone has already gone down, this tells you that you've, you've overshot by one cone. And, and you should be watching the kiln fairly closely. So this one might go down, but, but you wouldn't want you know, any more, and many more to go down because it means you severely overfired. So this is sort of a standard practice to put them in groups of three, guide witness and guard cone. And that's called a cone pack. This is called a cone plaque. This, this group is a cone pack. We hope you're enjoying the show. Please take a moment to leave a five-star review on your podcast platform of choice. It really helps new listeners find the show. Don't forget to subscribe to receive updates as new episodes are released. And if you'd like to support the video and podcast production of the Potter's Roundtable, become a patron. Go to patreon.com and search for the Potter's Roundtable. Your support will help us achieve our goal of creating a digital library spanning the ceramic arts for use by educators and artists alike. Thank you for your support. Now let's get back to the show. So cone packs, typically, they're set on the shelf of the, of the kiln um, where you can see them. So when you're loading the kiln, you place the cone packs in places where you can see them through the, through the ports or through the, the viewports of the peepholes. They can also, I found it very handy in electric kilns, they can be set on the top of posts so that you don't have to plan your shelves necessarily to align with the peepholes. You can put a post in front of the peephole and set a cone pack just on top of that post so that you can still see it through the, view, through the, through the peephole. So when the, when the, when, during the firing, when the tip of the, the what, what's considered down, or when you, when, in terms of when is the cone done, when the tip of the cone just touches the base 
that's, that's considered down. So as I showed, I mentioned earlier, so this is an example. This again was a seven, nine, 10 pack. So this is a cone 10 just down. That's perfect. That's the end of the fire. That, that means that I've just reached cone 10. So when the tip touches the base, it's done. When it starts to droop and sag, like these two, you can see this, this nine, this is over fired already for the nine. This has already started to melt. And one thing that if, if you keep firing these cones, they'll eventually all melt because they're just clay bodies. So if you can, depending on the different composition, if I heat them high enough, they will completely melt. Um, well, along those lines, one of the things that I found is really useful is when I'm setting the cones into a kiln, I usually set them on some kind of a slab of scrap clay or a little base or a plaque, specifically that reason to catch the melted clay. And so I've made some cases like this was just a, a scrap shard of clay that I had that I set them on. But again, it catches the cones and it keeps, and, and when they met, when they partially melt like that, they can stick to the cone shelf, to the kiln shelf. So it helps me with the cleaning. It's a little easier. Sometimes I'll make up a little tray like this with sides on it, just out of, again, out of scrap clay to catch the melt. Um, here's an example of for recent firing where in a, in a cone 10 firing with a gas kiln, when you're going to higher temperature, a fairly common practice is to include a set of cones for the firing itself for the end of the firing, such as 7, 9, 10. But you also would include a set of cones to tell you when to go into reduction, to body reduction or glaze reduction. And those would typically be low fire cones, like 06, 07, 08. Um, I found for best practice in our kiln here, we have a small gas fired Olympic kiln. And for the best practice I found, I actually start reduction at 012. So I'll have, a, I'll have two kiln cones. I'll have an 012 and an 09, which tell me roughly the range that I should be, I'd be shut, should be starting reduction. And then I have a set of large cones for the kiln firing. Well, when I get to the temperature where I'm, I'm looking for the large cones to melt, the soft cones have turned into, the little cones have turned into a puddle. So in this case, that, and that's, that makes a really nice glass, which can glue itself to the shelf. So this is a case where you can see with this case, the, this, this 10 was passed down, but the, the small group of cones in the front have completely melted. And, and I've even, I've, I've especially done this in a wood kiln, in wood kiln firing, because in wood kilns, Generally, you have even less control of the, precise control of the temperature than you do in a gas kiln or electric kiln. And so, A, the, the, the cones I found, I had to use all large cones because the cones are further back in the kiln, they're farther from the viewport. So in order to be able to see them, I need to use large cones, even for the low temperature cones. Well, the problem is when they melt, they really make a puddle. So I actually made a little tray that I could put them in and all of that black, so this was again, this was a, a, the, the large cones for the frying and all of this dark colored here, those are the, the lower temperature cones completely melted. So that would have made a little bit of a mess on my shelf. Um, so in this case, again, I actually made a little tray to catch, to catch the melt. So I found that's a really handy thing to do. It's just, it, again, it just saves you a little cleaning of the shelves. So as far as electric kilns, when the when the cones, when the, the small cones are used in the kiln sitter in an electric kiln, and the way they're used, they're used basically to prevent, the kiln sitter, by the way, is really not, never, was never intended to be a kiln control device. It was really designed primarily to be a safety device to prevent, to prevent over firing. So in, the, in an electric kiln, at, in the end of the rod, there's, a, there's a, 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 a ceramic rod that sticks into the kiln, and at the end of the rod, if I look at it head on, there are two blades or cone supports that look sort of like this. And what you do is, and this is, here is the, and here's the, the end of the ceramic rod I'm looking at. What you do is you set, the, you set the cone across these supports like that, and then there's a little movable rod like a finger that rests on top. So you set the, you set the cone across these kiln, the rest, these are made out of, out of metal, temperature resistant metal, as is the rod, set the cone across it, and then you lower the rod on top of it. And in terms of precautions, you have to be careful that the, that the, the cone is not touching the end of the ceramic rod. So that when you look side, these blades stick out, oh, I'd say a half an inch from the end of the, the face of the rod. So you wanna make sure that the cone is not touching the rod because when the cone softens, it gets slightly sticky. And if it's stuck to the end of the ceramic rod, then it couldn't bend properly. What happens during the firing is that as the cone softens, it droops down, it's, it bends slightly like this, and then the rod drops, and on the other end of the rod, it trips a switch and shuts the kiln off. 
So you don't want to do anything to block, to prevent this, the cone from drop, drooping. So if it, were, if it were against the end of the ceramic rod, it could stick and not drop, and then the kiln would overfire. One other final precaution I would suggest when you, for using for small cones for, for, for the, uh, the kiln sitter is before, you, I'll, I'll use the large one, but I do it for all of these. Before you put it in the kiln sitter, Take the, take the cone and roll it between your fingers like this, with two fingers on one side and one on another, because occasionally there'll be a defect in the cone, and there might be a crack or a little weak spot. And if you put, if you put the cone, especially these small little skinny cones, if you put this in the kiln setter and it's got a weak spot, it could break prematurely and shut the kiln off. So a, an easy way to find a defective cone is I just roll it very gently between my fingers, not enough to snap it. But if the cone is defective, it'll just break very easily in your fingers, and then you can discard it, rather than have it interrupt your firing. And the, the, one of the, the reasons for doing that is glazes never seem to melt the, exactly the same the second firing as they do the first time. The glazes seem to work the best is when, they, when they're heated up, if you just keep the heating going and the, the sequence of things happens as you heat it up, and it can keep on going, but then stopping the firing in the middle and then starting it over again, the, the, kiln, the glazes never behave exactly the same. They don't work as well. So during the firing, you're observing, you're observing the cones through the peephole or through a viewport on your kiln. And sometimes it's hard to see when everything in the kiln is, especially when you're toward the end of the firing, when everything in the kiln is glowing bright orange, and the bricks are glowing orange, and the pots are glowing orange, and the cones are glowing orange, it's hard to see, with an electric kiln at least, it's hard to see what the cones are doing even if they're on the edge of the shelf, close to the peephole. So one little trick I found is, when I want to take a look at the cones in an electric kiln, I'll pull the peephole plug out, and I'll blow a little puff of air into the peephole, like, like that. What that does is it, it just instantaneously cools off the, because the cones are small, it cools them off, and they turn dark gray or black, and you can see them against the background. And then in a couple of seconds, they warm up again and they turn orange. But for that brief instant, when you blow the puff of air onto them, because the air is about you know, 2,000 degrees cooler than what's in the kiln, it changes the color enough where you can see them, and it makes them easy to see. So in addition to monitoring, in addition to monitoring the firing and looking at, at watching how the firing has progressed, a, a, an important use of, of cones is to map the kiln, and that is, they, because they respond differently to temperature, if you have a kiln that's either a new kiln to you or even if you're, you've, you've changed to a different studio where you're unfamiliar with the kiln, there's just about no kiln that fires perfectly uniformly everywhere in the kiln. So you can do what's called mapping the kiln, and that is you put cone packs at various locations throughout the kiln, maybe the top and the bottom, the, the center of the kiln, the edges of the kiln, and when you do a firing, then after, you're not, you don't worry about looking at them all during the firing, but then after the firing, you can look at the different cones and compare them and, and see, for instance, were the, was the center of the shelf generally, was it, was it cooler than the edges of the shelf? Or was the bottom cooler than the top? In some cases, you can compensate for some of these temperature differences by the way you load or the way you space the shelves. But in other cases, it might just be an inherent property of the kiln, and you have to work around it. So then you know, for example, maybe that a certain portion of the kiln runs a little cooler, and so you would choose to put certain glazes in response in that temp in that area that will survive or will work, you know, still work with those temperatures. Okay, so what do cones actually do? Well, this is important. They don't measure temperature. Even though we refer to them, because we when we talk about a cone chart, we refer to them, we say an O19 at this heating rate is equal to 1249. They don't actually measure temperature. What they actually do is they, they respond or they show the, the effect of a combination of temperature and time. And that combination of temperature and time is called heat work. And that is, that's the amount of heat over a period of time that has produced a certain effect on the material. So, and the, 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 the great thing about cones is, is that they respond, because they are made out of clay bodies, basically, they respond to the firing the same way in the same manner that your pots do. In order for this cone to melt, there are certain changes that have to happen in the cone. The same way, in order to properly fire your clay bodies or fire your glazes, there are, there's a whole sequence, which we'll talk about in a minute, there's a whole sequence of changes that have to happen, and that requires time. And this is kind of, an, this is analogous, for instance, to cooking a roast beef. You could say, well, I'm gonna put a roast beef in the oven, 
at 350 for three hours, why not put it in there for, at 750 for an hour and a half? Well, because you know it won't come out right. The outside will be burned and the inside will be raw um, because even with, with and this is, this is a good analogy for cooking because it takes time for things to happen. It isn't just the heat or the temperature, it takes time. So cones, so firings really should be monitored by cones, not by temperature. The only thing that temperature is really good for, frankly, is for monitoring the rate of temperature increase or the progress of a firing. Is your kiln heating up properly? Is it continuing to go up in temperature? Uh, especially, for example, if you're firing a gas kiln or a wood kiln, where, where kilns can tend to do what they call stall, where the temperature seems to plateau out and you're not making any progress. You can't necessarily tell that by just looking at the color of the kiln. But the monitoring the temperature will say, OK, I need to do some adjustment, something in order to keep the temperature climbing. But, but you, shouldn't be, you shouldn't necessarily be judging the, your, your, your glaze results or your, your clay results by the temperature alone. I, may, I alluded to this, one, and one of the, one of the, an unu, there's an unusual effect with cones that I, that I alluded to earlier, that the faster you fire to a particular cone, you actually get to a higher temperature. And the, reason, and the reason is this, is if I'm firing for a particular cone to bend, it takes a certain amount of heat work for that cone to bend, meaning it takes a certain combination of time and temperature for that cone to bend. Well, if I'm firing faster, then the contribution from time is less. So the contribution from temperature or heat has to be more to make this cone, the same cone bend. And as I mentioned earlier, that slight difference in temperature, which can be 20 degrees, 30 degrees, really will have a negligible effect on the clay body. You won't see it, but it can have a significant effect on glazes. That's enough to make some glazes run, depending on just the heating rate. I see that a lot, actually, when I talk to teachers that, either, that are either working in, in schools or in community studios where there's a lot of pressure to get the work through the kilns quickly. There's a lot, there are a lot of pots being made. People want their pots back. And so they tend to do quick firings. And so one of the problems I've seen, I've, I've been approached by this, is people say, well, look, I did this firing, and all my, my number six cones are down perfectly. They're not overfired, and yet all the glazes ran. And so the first question I ask you is, well, how quickly did you fire? And they say, oh, yeah, well, I did a rapid firing because I have a lot of pots to fire. Well, that was the problem. Because with the rapid firing, they probably got to 20, maybe 30 degrees hotter than normal. And that's enough, especially with cone six or earthenware glazes, to make some glazes run. They're overfired and you slow it down and you, and you don't get to quite as high a temperature, the results, and then, then the glazes don't run and the results are better. Okay, some recommendations here um, as far as, you know, in terms of using cones. Um, it's, first of all, it's okay to use old cones. If you have, I, or if I've, I've inherited cones when I've bought supplies from other people that look like they're antiques and they're still packed in vermiculite and the, the boxes have all turned brown. It's okay to use them because cones don't age. They're clay, basically. They're clay bodies of different compositions, and they're dried, and they just sit there. So they, they don't go bad. Um, so I would, again, I would really recommend use cones to control your firings. Um, and the, the, uh, an important point here also, I think, is the actual number on the cone doesn't matter. In other words, with some experimentation with your glazes and your clay and the way you fire and the way you load your kiln, Find out the best cone number or the best type of cone that gives you the best results and use it. It doesn't matter exactly what the number is. If you have, if you have a certain set of glazes and you find that a small number seven cone, when that cone bends, gives you the perfect results, use it. That's fine. Even though maybe your, your glazes are called cone six glazes, they, uh, their point is find the cones that work for you. Forget the numbers for the time being. Again, also a reminder, if you have a, have a kiln, if you get a new kiln or you're working with a kiln that you're unfamiliar with, before you do any, any, a, series, a lot of firings, map the kiln. Check out the kiln so you can find out how uniform the temperatures are in the kiln. Don't use a kiln sitter as a controller. Everybody does this, but there are too many things that can go wrong with a kiln sitter to, and to be reliable. As I mentioned, if the, cone, if the cone is defective, it can break prematurely and the kiln is overfired. If the cone melts and gets sticky, it can actually stick to the support <laughs> blades and not drop properly. So it can, as it starts to bend and it comes more in contact with the blades, it'll actually stick to the blades and, and it won't drop until it gets way overfired. 
Um, so there are too many things that can go wrong with a, with a, kiln, with a, con, a kiln sitter and cones to use that as a, re, as a really precise controller. You should be firing with cones. And then one, one additional suggestion is, I would say, we found here at, at Washington Street Studios, it's very useful to, to have a hold at the end of a glaze firing. So typically, for instance, for a cone six firing, we'll, we'll actually do a slow glaze firing to cone five, and then we add a 25 minute hold. And what that does is it gives us, it slows down the, the heating rate, and it gives us a time for the temperatures to equalize. We did some early tests here when we were first setting up these kilns, these were new kilns, and we found out we got much, much better, more uniform results with the hold rather than going directly to cone six. And when you add, again, because cones are responding to temperature and time, when I add a certain amount of time, that actually is going to a higher cone. So if I go to cone five and add a 25 minute hold, I'm effectively going to cone six with respect to heat work, not temperature, but heat work. But I haven't overshot the temperature. Okay, well, I hope this, I hope this discussion has been useful. If you enjoyed it, please like it and also subscribe to our channel. And we'd appreciate it if you'd share it with your friends and your potters. This helps our, helps our videos to get found on YouTube. Um, also, if you'd like to support our educational efforts, please go to patreon.com and also search for, the, and search for the Potter's Roundtable. Finally, you can check out our website, www.hfclay.com. The, the next topic in the series is going to be what happens during a glaze firing. And that will probably be the final presentation in this first section. And then we'll be talking about raw materials. So thank you for visiting with us today. The Potter's Roundtable is brought to you by Washington Street Studios and our patrons. If you enjoy the show, please subscribe, give us a five-star review, and tell your friends. If you want to learn more about Washington Street Studios and shared studio memberships, please visit our website at www.hfclay.com. Thank you, and we'll see you again next time on the Potter's Roundtable.